certainly those are the sentiments of my heart. When I was growing up, we used to sing a song that said, every day with Jesus is sweeter. Somebody else was growing up singing that song too. Sweeter than the day before. Certainly I am glad and I'm thanking the Lord for being here. It is always a privilege to come to the farm. Um, I don't know how it is that from time to time when I come here, I forget how wonderful it is to be here and I am struck anew uh, with the beauty and the peace of this wonderful space uh, that has been set aside for justice work, which is indeed the work of the Lord. I want to offer um, also my deep gratitude and thanks um, to Mrs. Edelman. I want to be clear that I do so beyond the appropriate protocols that always apply when one is invited to preach in another preacher's pulpit. Uh, I know this is Haley Farm, and this is the Lynch Riggio Chapel, but this is Mrs. Edelman's house. It's a great house. And I, um, I'm really honored to be here, but uh, today I am particularly grateful and I want um, to express my deep gratitude and respect to Mrs. Edelman for the longevity and consistency of her witness. Somebody say amen, that's right. Not only not only her witness, but the witness of uh, several others of you who are, pre who are present in this room. Um, I am aware I have been in the ministry for most of my life and have been black all of my life and a woman all of my life. Um, but I've been a pastor and leader of a particular group of people for a little over four years. And leading is sometimes wearying work. But Mrs. Edelman, when I see you and others like Dr. Moss, I am encouraged and inspired, and I can say with the words of the old spiritual, I don't feel no ways tired. So I do want to thank you for staying in this fight. Um, it must be difficult to feel like you're covering the same terrain again only worse, because they now know our tactics, and they seem sometimes to be immune to our tactics. So I just want to thank you for staying in the battle and not giving up. Um, I think many of us have the same things on our minds, and I have been trying over the last couple of days, actually the last a year and a half to try to make sense of what is um, going on, of what happened to Trayvon Martin, and then more recently, the uh, verdict in Florida. And so uh, I'm going to do a bit of reflecting on that tonight. I don't hope to answer the question. They still are going around in my mind, but I, I'm, I'm not going to avoid them. And so I'm going to invite you to consider with me very familiar story, if not necessarily familiar scripture, found in the Gospel of Luke, the 10th chapter. Luke chapter 10. I want everybody to be whoever you are, but if you come from a talkback tradition, I promise you, if I go all the way to won't he do it, I'm just going to quit. <laughs> all right. Luke chapter 10, beginning with verse 25. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? 
What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him. And when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. I want to talk to you tonight from the subject, Neighborhood Watch. God help me. God help us. This past week at our church in the heart of North Philadelphia, located on the edge of Center City and an up and coming neighborhood called Northern Liberties on one side, Chinatown on the other side, and the Richard Allen projects on another side. This past week, our church was holding our annual Vacation Bible School. I say the words Vacation Bible School with awe because I have always loved Vacation Bible School. And when I was a child growing up in West Virginia, uh, Vacation Bible School was my favorite church-going activity in the entire year. Vacation Bible School was the time when we came to church and we sang fun songs. And we had good food. And we made a bunch of junk, I mean crafts. <laughs> Vacation Bible School was the time when uh, not only our members and the children who were a part of our congregation came to the church, but all of the children from the rest of the community also came to the church. And so we always had a house full of children during vacation Bible school. And I love vacation Bible school to this day for those same reasons. I was surrounded last week and relishing as pastor the beauty and the vitality, the unharnessed energy of the children. From the cradle roll, where my nine, almost 10-month-old Bella was not even the youngest child in the nursery, uh, to the groups of boys and girls in uh, the beginners and the primaries and the juniors, and even the stank attitude high school students. <laughs> It was wonderful to be in vacation Bible school. But even as we gathered to delve into the theme of our hope in Christ, even as we gathered to teach the Bible and sing the songs and eat the food and make the junk, I mean crafts, I was keenly aware that there were jurors in Sanford, Florida, 
who were hearing testimony, who were hearing arguments, closing arguments, both from the prosecution and from the defense. And then finally, towards the end of the week, they were deliberating about the fate of a man by the name of George Zimmerman. Now, George Zimmerman was in his car on the 26th of February, 2012, when he saw a stranger, a young man wearing a hoodie. Uh, we later learned what he did not know is that the young man was coming home from a snack break in the midst of the NBA All-Star Game, carrying a bag of Skittles and Arizona iced tea. The encounter between George Zimmerman and Trayvon Martin ended when Trayvon Martin felt the piercing of a bullet that went into his chest and stopped his heart. A bullet fired from a gun that George Zimmerman was legally carrying. George Zimmerman said that this was self-defense and invoked the stand your ground laws of the state of Florida. And while we were in vacation Bible school in our complex neighborhood in North Philadelphia, where young black men get shot too, there was a jury in Florida deliberating about the fate of George Zimmerman. About the middle of last week, I had a conversation with a defense attorney in our congregation who made it clear to me that it was unlikely that jurors in Sanford, Florida would be able, on the basis of the law, to convict George Zimmerman. I argued with him, but I knew what he said was true, that you cannot get just fruit from an unjust tree. And that the problem, that the problem I was lamenting was a problem not only in the heart of George Zimmerman, but also in the laws of the state of Florida, also in the conduct of the police who did not treat that scene as if George Zimmerman had committed a crime, did not treat George Zimmerman as if he had committed a crime, did not treat Trayvon Martin as if he were the victim of any crime. The defense attorney in my congregation convinced me of what I did not want to hear and still on Saturday evening could not believe. He was acquitted. It was not possible, not according to the law, to convict him. I was reminded again of a quote from Richard Wright in a piece written in 1937 called The Ex Ethics of Living Jim Crow, where he wrote, Negroes who lived south know the dread of being caught alone upon the streets in white neighborhoods after the sun has set. In such a simple situation as this, the plight of the Negro in America is graphically symbolized. While white strangers may be in these neighborhoods trying to get home, they can pass unmolested. But the color of a Negro's skin makes him easily recognizable, makes him suspect. 1937, y'all hear this? Converts him into a defenseless target. And that's the end of the quote. I was reminded of yet an earlier quote found in the book of Jeremiah that says there is a sound in Rama of Rachel. Rama was uh, in the tribe of Benjamin. Rachel is Benjamin's mama weeping for her children because they were no more. What happened to Rachel's children? They were taken captive. What happened to Rachel's children? They were murdered. What happened to Rachel's children? They were assassinated. What happened? What is happening to Rachel's children and Rachel's friends? They're debased and demeaned and miseducated. The terrible irony, though, is that George Zimmerman was a Neighborhood Watch volunteer. Neighborhood Watch is an organization that is intended to keep the peace. 
uh, on their website, they comment that not only does Neighborhood Watch allow citizens to help in the fight against crime, it is also an opportunity for communities to bond through service. The Neighborhood Watch program draws upon the compassion of average citizens, asking them to lend their neighbors a hand. Lend your neighbor, George Zimmerman, a hand. George Zimmerman was supposedly driving around trying to figure out how to lend his neighbors a hand. I imagine that if you had called him on his phone while he was driving around, that's what he would have said that he was doing. I'm driving around because I want to give my neighbors a hand. The problem is that George Zimmerman, when he asked himself the question, who is my neighbor? did not include Trayvon Martin. He was his neighbor. He just never even gave it any consideration that it was possible. This question of who is my neighbor and its unspoken corollary, who is not my neighbor, reminds me of the scene from the gospel lesson that I just read to you in your hearing. It is the story of a lawyer, a person who's always looking for loopholes, no offense, Mrs. Edelman. <laughs> it's the story of a lawyer, a learned person, who comes to Jesus not with good intentions, but with the intention of testing Jesus, of flexing his intellectual and spiritual muscles before Jesus. Jesus has been drawing crowds by his preaching and teaching of the gospel of the kingdom, talking about the ways of God, the purposes of God, the means that God is going to use to bring harmony in community. And this particular lawyer cannot stand the idea that Jesus might be developing a lingering following of people who are going to buy the reasoning and the vision that he is offering. And so to test Jesus, he offers him an opportunity to, to tell me how it is that I can inherit this eternal life, this life from above, this extra special abundant life of which you are speaking. And Jesus says, you tell me. After all, you're the lawyer. You're the person who is learned. What is it that you have been reading? What is it that you have been studying? And so the lawyer offers him the encapsulation of the meaning of the entirety of God's plan and covenant purpose. Uh, you've got to love God with everything that you are. You've got to love God with all of your heart and all of your might and all of your strength. You've got to love God and you've got to love your neighbor. Love God and and love your neighbor, love God. Everything is encapsulated in this idea that you can love God and love your neighbor. Love God with everything and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, that's a good answer. <laughs> do that. You've been asking about eternal life. Do that and you will live. But apparently, this lawyer really was looking for a loophole. Uh, despite the fact that he already knew the answer, despite the fact that before him was the opportunity for life. Do that and you will live. He asked this question, but who is my neighbor? Again, with the unspoken corollary, who is not? I get the God part, got that under my belt. Do that, no sweat. But this neighbor thing gets a little complex for me and difficult, and I'm trying to find a way to know what the limits are of my love for my neighbor. How much loving of the neighbor do I have to do? I mean, how far do I have to go before I'm outside of the bounds of the neighborhood? 
Uh, how, how far do I have to reach before my love can run out? Who is it that I have to love like myself? And who is it that I can leave by the wayside and forget that they even exist? Who is it who is my neighbor? And who can I treat like they're not even human? Let me pause and say, as I said to my congregation when I preached a version of this sermon yesterday to them, I'm not George Zimmerman's pastor. He never called me and asked me to say a word to him. I'm not talking to George Zimmerman. I'm talking to folks who gathered at Haley Farm because we believe in a wide neighborhood. But I'm wondering, can you admit that as wide as you believe the neighborhood ought to be, there are some folks that you don't think of as your neighbor. Some people you'd like to leave out of your neighborhood. Uh, some people who when they drive up in the moving van and get out and start unloading their tacky furniture, you wonder what's going to happen to the property values in your neighborhood. <laughs> who? Who is my neighbor? Jesus tells a story. You all, I know you've heard the story before. The story is about a man who found himself on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. Jericho Road was a place that was filled with hazards. It's exactly the kind of setting in which you would like to set up a neighborhood watch. It's the kind of place where people could fall into the hands of other people who meant them harm and intended to rob them and would leave them for dead. And one man happened by in just such a moment and fell into the hands of some lurking thieves. And the lurking thieves robbed him and beat him and left him for dead. I, I don't know whether there was anybody around when he was being robbed, but it is the kind of place where you wish somebody would pick out their cell phone and call 911 and say something terrible is happening on this road. Something terrible is happening in our neighborhood. Nobody did that. If you'll allow me to use my imagination, I can imagine that the man is lying there, bleeding. He is lying there, both broke and broken, lying there in and out of consciousness. And he asked God, can you please help me? God says, I got some folks who are actually already on their way down that road whom I'm going to send to help you. I've got some religious types, some folks who believe in serving God and who believe in studying God's word and who lift holy hands in the sanctuary and give God the glory. I've got a, pr a priest who's coming. He's coming. He's already, he's not even going to have to go out of his way to help you. I'm going to send a priest down the Jericho Road with his Bible in his hand and he'll put the Bible down long enough to help you as the man is lying there broke and broken. God said, I've got some people who are going to help you and God sends a priest. The priest sees the man and the priest doesn't have time. Bible quoting. Bible token. I know, I know that you all have been posting on Facebook that statement that says that the devil cares whether you're carrying your Bible or not. And I can promise you that while it looks good on Facebook, the devil likes nothing better than for you just to carry your Bible. <laughs> devil used that Bible token priest who kept going and God didn't give up. That's not the only religious person, not the only one of my people who's on the road. I, I sent the priest, but the priest, maybe he was going to offer a sacrifice. He was otherwise engaged. He was tunnel visioned, trying to do the work that he believed that God had called him to do so much so that he didn't feel like I, I'm preaching to myself right now. Because that any preachers in the house, that happens to us sometimes. 
Uh, we get so busy praising our Jesus, serving our Jesus, that we ain't got time to actually do the work. And maybe the priest is too busy, I'm imagining that God said. But there is also a Levite, a professionally religious person. Uh, the Levites were the tribe who were dedicated to the service of the Lord. They were the people whose grandparents and grandparents, grandparents, and grandparents, grandparents, grandparents. Not only did they know the hymns in the hymnal, but they were the ones who had written them all. And so uh, the Bible toting priest went by. But here comes the hymn book in the hand of the Levite. The Levite is on his way singing the song, the new song that God has placed in his heart and there the broke and broken man is lying and the Levite, the professional religious person, that's all the rest of y'all. The Levite sees the man and he too walks by. I imagine that the Levite and the priest got to prayer meeting. As they were giving their testimony about how the Lord had brought them through danger seen and unseen. You know, church, I was on the Jericho Road today, and you know how dangerous the Jericho Road is? It was so dangerous that there was a man lying there. I thank God I didn't come 10 minutes earlier. It could have been me. imagine that after they got through with the testimony that they probably said I don't know his name but let's pray for him <laughs> and then there was a Samaritan and now you have to understand having the words good and Samaritan ringing in our ears from years and years and generations and generations of Sunday school where we have read and heard and preached and thought about this text that, that it is hard for us to imagine how grating a sound the word Samaritan would have been in the ear of the lawyer and not just the lawyer but all of the other people who were listening to Jesus give them a check on their religiousness. Samaritan meant, if nothing else to them, it meant somebody who got God wrong. The problem with Samaritans from the perspective of Jesus' hearers was not only that they were ethnically impure, but they were also theologically incorrect. They got everything wrong, but particularly they got God wrong. And here comes the Samaritan. The text says that the Samaritan sees the man and is moved with compassion. And what we learn immediately from those words, moved with compassion, having pity on him, is that while the priest had a Bible and the Levite had a hymn book, the Samaritan had a heart. The Samaritan goes to the man and engages the man in such a way that he's implicated in the man's suffering. He doesn't send back somebody else to help the man. He helps him himself. And wherever it was he was heading, he decided it could wait. He goes to the man and himself binds the wounds of the man. Himself engages with the broken and broke man. In himself engages with the bleeding and hurt man. Himself takes care of the man. But not only does he stop 
and get up close and personal. He also inconveniences himself with the investment of his resources, beginning with his donkey. He bought that donkey so he'd have a ride. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> he got off his own donkey and put the hurt person on it. That's inconvenient, at the very least. Who knows what could have happened to the donkey from carrying the hurt man? You put wear and tear on a donkey when you put hurt people on it. <laughs> wear out the tires on a donkey when you put hurt people on it. Takes him to a place where he continues to care for him until he is stable and then invests some more, not only on the spot, but says to the innkeeper, I'm going to give you something to take care of him now. And if it costs more than I've already given you, when I get back, I will repay. Jesus then, having told the story, turns back to the lawyer who asked this question, who is my neighbor, which always has within it the unspoken corollary of who is not. And he turns the entirety of the question around and says, who was his neighbor? That is, who acted like a neighbor to the man who had fallen among robbers. He says, the lawyer says, because he's not stupid, he's just bigoted like most of us. <laughs> the one who showed him mercy, effectively the one who had a heart. Jesus Remembering the original question, what must I do to really live? What must I do to be a partaker in this big project that you're talking about, Jesus? What is it that I need to do to have a part in God's project? Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life with, I believe that Jesus has the original question on his mind when he says to the lawyer, now go and do likewise. Brothers and sisters, I am a firm believer in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I can say with the apostle that I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Crazy story though it is, it is the power, I believe it, Dr. Moss, that it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone. But I know that we get God wrong. If we think that the power of salvation is just about what happens to us between the walls of churches between 11 and 1 o'clock on Sunday mornings. I know and I believe the scripture teaches, this is how I read it, that the fruit of the gospel at work in us is the gospel at work through us. Let me say that again. The fruit of the gospel at work in us is not just that it makes you a better family member to the folks in your house. Not just that it makes you a better member for your pastor at your church. Not just that it makes you a better preacher when you stand before the people. Not just that it gives you a sense of viability and life for your own person and personal life. But the gospel when it is at work in us for real makes a difference in the neighborhood. <laughs> Was reading on Facebook early Sunday morning 
And I was challenged by the words of a conspiracy theorist who surmised that the reason why the verdict came back on Saturday night was because, as he put it, Negroes will be in church tomorrow hearing about forgiveness and learning to be quiet. <laughs> he surmised that what it would mean for us to be in church yesterday morning is that we would be calmed down and our anger would be diffused and our sense of outrage at the injustice would be diffused and we'd go home feeling good about having gotten our praise on on Sunday morning and we would not do a blessed thing. I was challenged by it and I realized that the world is looking at us and listening to us. Our neighborhood is watching to see whether we who are the pious, whether those of us who are the professionally religious will walk by the broken and the broke, whether those of us who pay our tithes and fast and pray during Lent will walk by the people who are hurting in our community. The people in our neighborhood are watching us. They're listening, preachers, to see what we will say. Martin Luther King Jr. famously said, on the one hand, we are called to play the Good Samaritan on life's roadside. Uh, but that will be only an initial act. One day we must come to see that the whole Jericho Road must be transformed so that men and women will not be constantly beaten and robbed as they make their journey on life's highway. True compassion, King said, is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It is not haphazard and superficial. It comes to see that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. He said that in a book called The Time to Break Silence. We've come here this week because we recognize that what's happening in our nation is a crime. It may not be a crime in Florida to shoot down an unarmed teenager for walking down the sidewalk, but it is a moral crime and an injustice. It is a crime what's happening to our children and our neighborhoods are watching to see what we are going to do. It is a crime that there is a proliferation of guns, not only the assault weapons, such as those who struck down those children in Newtown, but also the many weapons insecure in homes that every week, every almost day, some little kid shoots him or herself or his or her brother or his or her grandmother with an unsecured gun that people kept in the house to keep them safe. It's a crime that so many black and brown children live separated from their parents due to mass incarceration. And it is a further crime that's what's happening in their educational system is creating a pipeline for them to follow those parents into prisons that we find room and money to build when we cannot fund public education. It's a crime. It's a crime last week that the Farm Bill passed without food aid. And even though the president will not sign it, most likely what will happen when they come to the negotiating table is that the aid that goes to hungry children will be severely cut while we continue to keep Monsanto in business, putting far small farmers out of business. It's a crime. It's a crime, the theological malpractice that is happening in churches all over this nation where young children learn to name it and claim it, but they can't spell it. They don't believe in some churches that the power in the name of Jesus to break chains includes the chains that bind the children after they leave the church. The neighborhood is watching. 
those of us who call ourselves people of faith, priests and Levites, the neighborhood is watching to see whether we really will take a bite out of crime. In the name of our Christ and for the sake of Christ's loving dominion.